distractions during our presentations, but we strongly encourage and hope that you will engage throughout the webinar and welcome you to post any questions that come to you during the presentations in the chat box on the side of the screen as well, and then we will share those with the presenters during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, in addition, wanted to share that today's webinar is being recorded. Um, and we will share a link to that recording along with the slide deck and any uh, links to any resources that are shared during today's conversation in an email to all registrants. So keep an eye out for that email. It should come out next Monday. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to give you a heads up that we will be posting a very brief survey poll about today's conversation after the presentations and during the Q&A portion of the webinar, and really would encourage you to take just a couple of moments to uh, share your thoughts and feedbacks, thoughts and feedback on today's conversation to help us inform future conversations. And now I'd like to share a little bit of background about GLR Learning Tuesdays, the webinar series. As you can see on the screen in front of you, we've got a number of great sessions planned for the coming weeks, always on Tuesday, always starting at 3 p.m. Um, Eastern time. And we're hoping that this kind of regular, reliable schedule will make it um, easier for you and others to make plans to join in for these conversations on a regular basis. Um, we've already launched, or we've already hosted 13 webinars since we launched this series uh, last September. And so I would also encourage you to visit CLIP, that's the Campaign's Community for Learning, or Learning for Impact and Improvement platform, uh, where you can find the growing archive of webinar recordings, slide decks, and other resources exploring science emerging models and the work of leaders and partners in the field. And then I hope you'll also continue to save this date and time and make plans to join in for more of these great learning events. But now for today's conversation. We're very excited to talk about Early Head Start and what we can learn from it to make a difference for children and families. Um, as all of you on today's webinar, I'm sure know, research is continuing to point to the early years as an incredibly critical time for children's learning and brain development. And as all of us who care about children and families work to support children during these early years, early, the Early Head Start program represents an incredibly powerful resource for us, both in terms of opportunities to promote expansion so that it can reach and support more young children, and also as a model that can inform other early learning programs. Um, so to help us explore the power and potential of Early Head Start today, I'm very excited to welcome and introduce Dr. Joan Lombardi, who will serve as the moderator for today's conversation. Joan is a longtime champion for children and families, having served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Obama administration. She was also one of the early founders of Early Head Start during her time in the Clinton administration. So welcome, Joan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sarah. I am really delighted to be here and to share with everyone the excitement that I think we all feel about the Early Head Start concept, the Early Head Start program. Um, if we could go to the next slide. I want to welcome everyone across the country. First of all, I'm delighted that so many could join us to talk about a, a topic that's really about the care and nurturing of our youngest children. I want to start with thanking Ralph Smith for his leadership, not only with the campaign, but in the belief that if you want to address grade level reading, you've got to start with our youngest learners. You can't wait till they're four, you can't wait till they enter school. So with that, I, I want to share a little bit first about the history of the program very briefly, and then also tell you a little bit about the advent of Early Head Start. I, I put this poster up. This is a picture of a poster that I have in my office. It's the original recruitment poster for Head Start from 1965. Um, so 55 years ago, when the war on poverty was just getting started, they founders really knew that to make a difference on family economic mobility, on the future of children's education, you had to invest in young children and families as a strategy for economic development, mobility, justice, and equality. Um, it is, in my mind, the Head Start program is the original two-generation program because it want, its goal was to assure 
comprehensive services for children, but also that very strong support of families and the importance of family voice. And I'm sure you'll be hearing about that throughout the webinar. Um, in 1965, the program started as a summer program for children right before they entered kindergarten. I often say it was very hopeful that we thought we would end poverty in a six or eight week summer program. And over the years, I think what we've learned is you've got to assure continuity of services throughout the early childhood period. So <clears throat> moving on throughout the years, what we heard was a call to expand the program to younger children. As early as 1966, when they started parent child centers in about 30 plus communities across the country. <clears throat> in, the, in the late 1960s, there was a recognition that the Migrant Head Start program, where people were working in the fields and bringing their babies with them, had to be a program that had children, served children zero to five. Then in 1970, in the, at the 15th anniversary of, the, of Head Start, during the Carter years, there was a call to expand the program to younger children. Throughout the 90s, as the brain science really became much more popular, starting <clears throat> with a call from the National Head Start Association itself at uh, the 25th anniversary and moving on to the Carnegie Corporation's call for expansion. And then finally, in um, 1994, there was a call to expand the program. So this has been a continuous refrain right from the beginning of the program that we need to serve younger children. Finally, in 1994, there was a call in the Head Start reauthorization <clears throat> to expand to services for pregnant women and children under three. And I think it's pretty exciting that even 20, more than 20 years ago, you saw the call to serve pregnant women and children under three. Again, that two generation focus. There was an advisory committee that was put together in 94 that basically said the program should focus on <clears throat> child development, family development, staff development, and of course, <clears throat> community development. Because as Yuri Braffenbrenner taught us right from those early years, Families are impacted by what's going on in the communities and communities, the policies around them. The first grants were in 1995, and you'll hear a little bit more about the history of the grants as we go on. Moving on to what is the core of the program, the core of the program, again, are these comprehensive services. That's what makes the program unique. To pregnant women and children under three, health, nutrition, mental health, family support and engagement, early learning opportunities, and community connections. And the great thing about the Early Head Start program is it provides the staffing levels to support those various components, which we often don't have in other programs. I put these two links here so that <clears throat> if you wanna look through the Early Head Start performance standards, they're in the document of the overall pro program performance standards. There's also early learning and early learning outcomes framework that has benchmarks for what we should be looking for throughout the birth through five period, which I think has implications for all programs, particularly those serving low income children. So, you know, in a, in a, in a nutshell, the program continues to need expansion. If we could go to the, Next slide, we know that we've got one in five babies and toddlers living in poverty. In 2018, the program Early Head Start only reached 8% of the eligible children. It's still under 10%. The good news is we had recent congressional action that'll expand the Head Start program, including an additional $100 million for Early Head Start <clears throat> and Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships. So that funding is coming in the upcoming year. We have um, need to continue to have opportunities to increase the funding at the federal level, but also to increase funding for similar concepts 
that mirror the early Head Start program at the state and community level. So let me stop there and just introduce our three speakers. I'll introduce all three of them. They're all tremendous champions for early childhood and for the program. And then I'll um, turn to Helen Rakes to start us off. Helen Rakes is a Willard Cather professor at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. She has been uh, part of the research efforts from the very beginning of the program. And she, but more than that, she's been a champion for the integration of research and practice. And I think that has been unique in the early Head Start research efforts that it's not about finding what the impact is at the end of a year or two. It's about learning about what makes a difference all along. We'll then hear from Ron Herndon, who is a dear friend. He's the director of the Albina Head Start program in Portland. He has been a champion for Head Start for decades. He was the president and chair of the board of the National Head Start Association for more than two decades, as I remember, Ronnie. And we just couldn't be happier to have you with us today. We'll then hear from Jessica Sager, who's the co-founder and CEO of All Our Kin. I think she's, you're probably, many of you are probably familiar with Jessica. She has spent her career focused on family child care and the importance of bringing <clears throat> family child care into this picture of early Head Start and making sure that it's not just center-based programming, but home-based programming as well. So let me stop my long-winded introduction and turn to Helen. Helen, you've been, as I said, doing research on Early Head Start since the program began. Can you tell us a little bit about what the research tells us about the program's impact and some of the key ingredients to its success? Yeah. Yes. yes. I'm, I'm pleased, pleased to share with you from the early Head Start research and evaluation. Um, first, next slide, um, we'll just do a little background. Um, early Head Start by the numbers. Are you able to hear me too? Uh, I just want to be sure. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Keep, going to go assume right you are. Send me a cue if you're not. Early Head Start by the numbers. This slide shows the early growth trajectory of Early Head Start from 68 programs in 1996 to, as of the 2012 count, 1,104 programs serving over 100,000 infants and toddlers and over 6,000 pregnant women, as Joan referred to. In the next slide, we see that the majority of programs, and this information comes from the program information report, or you may know it as the PIR, um, <clears throat> we see the majority of programs are either home-based, home visiting programs, or center-based, and about 40% of all programs are, are one and 40% are the other. Most of the center-based programs are five days a week and full day, um, and there are a few other, maybe about 6% of center-based programs that are serving children and families for a little bit shorter amount of time. Only about 3% are what we refer to as combination options or mixed approach with both home-based and center-based together. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. So in the next slide, um, back to 1996, when the program was rolling out, the Early Head Start Research and Evaluation Project was implemented. Of these first um, cohort sites, 17 participated in this research project that I'm going to tell you about today. And it's been fun for me as I've been watching people's names flash up as you've been introducing yourself. At least one site that was represented at that time is represented on this call today. Um, so these 17 sites participated in the research. Twice as many families as the program could serve were recruited in each community and were randomly assigned to Early Head Start and no Early Head Start. 
These children and families were assessed then when children were 14, 24, 36 months of age. And that, of course, was the end of the early Head Start program. But we were fortunate enough also to be able to follow them. Um, so we were able to assess their kindergarten readiness right before they entered school. And then once again, found them when they were in fifth grade to see how they were doing at that time when they were around age 10. There's actually some effort now to find the children one more time. Of course, the children are long, no longer children. They're young adults today, but there's hope to follow up with them and see how, how they're faring today. As we look at the next slide, it's important to say that these assessments were done with research partners at each site. So they were usually located at a nearby university. And it's important to say, too, that the research partners collected the randomized control trial data that I have just told you about, where half of the children went into the program, the other half went into a control group. Uh, but they also conducted other research as well. And uh, then it's pretty important also to say that these researchers included many of the preeminent infant toddler researchers that were um, active in the country at this time. Now, you know, in the mid 90s, as Joan pointed out. At the time the study began, there was very little information on the normative development or family processes related to low income infants and toddlers. And these researchers published several hundred peer review articles, essentially creating a literature on low income infants and toddlers where none had existed before. So as we go to the next slide, what did we learn about the impacts of early Head Start from the randomized control trial? So now, once again, remember, um, children who were in early Head Start were compared to to children in their own communities who did not receive early Head Start services. So this, um, what I'm reporting from here is when children were age three and had completed the program. And we see that early Head Start children had significantly higher immunization rates, fewer emergency room visits for accidents and injuries, um, they had higher cognitive development scores as measured by the Bailey MDI, larger receptive vocabularies, lower levels of aggressive behavior as reported by their parents and and using a videotape methodology where parents and children play together you're told to play the way you normally do but we're given three bags with objects um, children were then videotaped playing with their parents and uh, video coders who were blind to whether they were in early head start of the comparison group coded um, their interactions and what we found from these codes were that early head start children were much more engaging of their parents and they had less negativity in their interactions as we turn to the next slide though we also see um, there were many impacts that pertain to parents um, as we remember and as Joan pointed out early head start is a two-generation program so from those same videotaped observations parents were observed to be more positive with their children than control group parents and they played with them more and this was true for mothers and fathers Early Head Start parents had higher home scores, the home observation for measurement of the environment, and they were providing more stimulating home environments and more support for learning than was true in the control group. Early Head Start parents were also more often providing daily reading to their children and less spanking. And this was true for both mothers and fathers. Um, the father's study was added as the project went forward. It didn't occur in every site. But when we were able to assess the fathers as well as the mothers, we saw that both of them were spanking less and were having these positive interactions. And then finally, the mothers spent more hours in education and job training than was true for the, the mothers in the control group. So what happened to them, next slide, um, by kindergarten entry? As I said, we assessed the children at 14, 24, 36 months, then also followed up with them as they were preparing to enter kindergarten. And once again, we were able to see that the children had fewer behavior problems as reported by their parents than was true for the control group. They also um, had higher approaches, positive approaches to learning, which of course is one of the goals of the Head Start program. They had larger receptive vocabularies, but this was true particularly for Spanish speaking children when assessed in English. Um, but we didn't see this difference any longer for the 
English speakers. And early Head Start children were more likely to be in formal care and education during the years from ages three to five. And we're gonna talk about that in just a few, a few minutes about the meanings of that. The parents as well were still showing positive effects. Uh, parents had higher scores on the home scale again, and it, it was particularly true, their scores were particularly um, strong in the area of providing warmth and in their interactions with the children. Parents had uh, higher scores on a summary of eight teaching activities, which was, you know, did we go over letters of the alphabet and are we reviewing numbers, these types of activities. These parents were still reading to their children daily, more often than was true for parents in the control group. And something that hadn't even appeared at age three was that the mothers actually had a lower risk for being depressed. Um, and why this didn't show up at age three, but did at age five, it makes a lot of sense because it takes quite a bit of time to put those services in place and to address maternal depression sometimes is, takes a little bit longer than some of the other effects, but there we were able to see that effect when children were age five and their parents were more likely to attend meetings or open houses at the child's program if the child was in some kind of an early childhood program. Okay, then what happened to the children after they entered elementary school? At grade five, which was seven years after the program entered, ended, we find the Early Head Start program group was only ahead on one outcome with a trend effect to have more positive social emotional successes. But these overall effects mask the real story, which was in the subgroups. Next slide. Okay, we saw four notable patterns. African American children and parents had very positive impacts at age three, at age five, and these maintained um, in grade five as well. The impacts for children in home-based or the home visiting programs, which had been largely parent impacts at age three, these grew for parents and children to age five and continued to grow to grade five. However, for Hispanics and children at highest risk, uh, the impacts improved to age five, but then they diminished. Um, so we had initially seen strong impacts as well for children who had both home visiting and center-based services, but these um, impacts did not maintain to age five. So the reason we didn't see these overall effects then at grade five was that for some they went up and for some they went down and they kind of canceled each other up. But we were still seeing some pretty strong impacts, particularly for African Americans and children who'd been in home-based programs. Why might that have been? Let's look at home-based programs. Well, if you remember, the age three impacts were on more parenting kinds of outcomes. They were often reading to their children, higher home scores, and so forth. And we think probably these continued to maintain for children as parents incorporated them into their parenting styles, um, leading to more positive outcomes for the children. So we decided then to turn away, next slide, um, to not only examine what was happening between the experimental group, those children who had early head start, and the control group, those who did not at these three ages, but to just look at all the children and their experiences and to see if there were more lessons that we could learn from that. So now I'm going to share with you just the tissue about uh, the non-experimental outcomes. So this slide, um, shows that by age five now, so now we're at age five, um, we see there were four groups. There were children who had no early head start and after they left early head start, they also did not have any formal care and education during the years three to five. So that means they did not have early head start and they didn't have Head Start or they didn't have Pre-K, didn't have any of those opportunities. So um, those are the, the represented by the white bars that you see here, children who had neither. Um, the yellow bars represent children who had early Head Start, but they didn't have the opportunity to go into formal care and education. So no Head Start for these children, no Pre-K. The blue bars represent those children who didn't get the early Head Start, but they got the formal care and education and Head Start. And the green bars, and that's where the big story is, um, represent those children who had both. Uh, they had both early Head Start and they had follow-up pre-K or 
more head start. And as you can see from these um, bars here, and these are from parenting outcomes, the home scores and daily reading, the children who are faring the best are the ones who got both this combination of services, early head start plus formal care and education. And those and the white bars um, who received neither were faring the worst with those who received one or the other um, somewhere in between. Next slide here. What is important to say is that this stair step pattern that you just saw as we examined children at age five really occurred for all of the outcomes that we looked at. And in some cases, the middle bars were, were reversed in the early head start. Children were looking slightly better than the children who got formal care and education and some uh, went the other direction. But the important thing was that the children who got the combinations were always looking the best and those who received no services were always faring the most poorly. Another thing to point out is that for highest risk children, if the early head start not only was followed by formal care and education, but if that formal care and education was head start with comprehensive two generation services, those children particularly benefited. Next slide here. So now let's go on to grade five and look about look and think about cumulative experiences. Um, by this time, um, we see now we still have four groups, um, children, but we have three things that we're looking at and are adding up, so to speak. Uh, we see a, a similar stair step arrangement. You can see what's coming. We have children who did not receive any of the three types of services that we accumulated. Those who had any one of the following um, early head start formal care and education which again could be head start or pre-k you know or some naeyc approved uh, program in their communities and then the third opportunity that we accumulated was if children were in um, below the mean or were in a school that was below the mean in the percentage of children who qualified for free and reduced lunch. In other words, not um, poverty schools, not the highest poverty schools, but for our sample, the lowest poverty schools were still at least half the children qualified for free and reduced lunch. So I, they were not um, schools that did not have poverty. But it, what you can see here, that those children who got none of these services were faring the most poorly. Those children who got all three, the purple bar on the right, were nearly at national averages, no achievement gap at grade five for these children. And there was a stair-step effect. So that if you got one, um, you, that was better than none. And if you got two, it was better than having one and so on. Okay, as we move to the next slide then. So, okay, no, I'm gonna hold here. Can you go back one slide, please? Thank you. So in sum, what we can say about early Head Start is that we did see effects, very strong effects in many, many outcomes for children at age three. Many of these maintained um, for children as they were ready to enter kindergarten. There were important effects in the experimental group, even in the fifth grade for certain subgroups, African-Americans and those who'd been in home visiting programs, most notably. Um, what we took away though from our non-experimental effects is that the effects of early Head Start are enhanced if children have follow-up services. So if they are able to get into formal care and education, that supports the advantages that they were able to obtain from early Head Start. And if their school um, is also supportive and, and uh, maybe less intensively poverty focused, um, that further supports the outcomes that we saw from early Head Start. So I'm gonna conclude there and in a moment, we'll take a look at this next slide. So <clears throat> Helen, thank you so much for that amazing overview. I would say to all the listeners, um, if you're interested in the research and kind of a summary of the research, Zero to Three has some terrific materials on their website. What our goal here is to put this research to work. So we have clear evidence from the early Head Start studies that if you start with comprehensive services at very young ages, you can prevent, <clears throat> move towards preventing that achievement gap. It's an important <clears throat> message for the grade level reading campaign that I hope you bring into the communities. Before I let you go, Helen, um, 
How is all this playing out in Nebraska? Because I know- Oh, you great. I'm excited to share this with you. So in Nebraska, if we could have the next slide, please. Um, we developed a program that was based on early Head Start. All right, and this is referred to as our sixpence program. In Nebraska, um, for about 15 years, we have had a $60 million endowment, which is two parts state funds, one part private funds from philanthropy, and then three parts local match, hence six pieces, and that's why it's referred to as sixpence. Um, since this program began, we've had some state general funds and front funds from the child care block grants that have been added to the project. Um, these programs are funded um, to school districts, um, they, which is a little different from Early Head Start where the um, grantee can be any number of different entities. Um, they serve highest need children in the communities, as is true for Early Head Start. And in Six Pence in Nebraska, 78% of the children have three or more risk factors. There are two programs that I'll just briefly tell you about. Like Early Head Start, um, programs can be either home-based or center-based. Um, we have these programs in 31 school districts in Nebraska, and we're serving about 1,200 children and families. The quality is guaranteed um, by not only the Head Start performance standards, because many of these programs begin as early Head, early head Start programs, and then think, uh, services or time or quality are added to them. Uh, but we also have um, what's referred to in statute as Rule 11, which sets high quality standards for early childhood programs in Nebraska. So this is our first program. Looks a lot like Early Head Start. In many cases, it is Early Head Start Plus. Program two are child care partners, partnerships, and they're a lot like Early Head Start child care partnerships. There we serve an additional 1,000 children. Um, here too, the grantees are school districts, um, and the school district employs a consultant to someone who's a certified teacher who works with and the um, providers locally in the community, um, half of them about our family child care providers at the other half or centers. And what we've been seeing in this um, form of the program is that quality perhaps wasn't as high when it began, but they're all in the Step Up to Quality program and through our TNTA and ongoing annual evaluation, we see every year quality is going up in our child care partnerships. So with that, that tells you what we're doing in Nebraska based on early head start. We're pretty excited about the six pence program and all the infants and toddlers and parents who are able to be served as a result. And I will then turn to my last slide. Um, my five grandchildren and I, <laughs> thank you for your time and attention. You can see I got a couple of infants and toddlers in that crew, pretty proud of them all. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for, uh, for all your work and dedication to, the re to documenting the impact of early Head Start and sharing that model um, with us from Nebraska. Because I want to be clear, this can happen with state funding um, and using the model, the early Head Start model, um, I think is important to get those impacts. They don't come without quality. So thanks, Helen. We may come back to you. I want to turn to Ron Herndon, um, and who's joining us by audio. Um, we heard from research. Now we're going to really turn to the to the practice and the advocacy. Ronnie, you've been working in Head Start for decades. What do you think makes early Head Start so special? What have you seen that it does for children and families? I think the primary reason is head, early Head Start staff. And this does not get discussed enough that the bonds of trust and respect that early Head Start staff develop with families that often last over years. I think that's what separates early Head Start from other programs. And for us at Albina, we're very fortunate that out of our 300 staff people, 71% are either current or former Head Start parents from uh, 35 different countries speaking 25 different languages. 
So you don't run into a problem of staff thinking that somehow they're doing parents a favor or somehow this is missionary work. That parent, that Head Start's, early Head Start staff come from the very communities that are being served. And for me, that is the, the essential reason that early Head Start has been so effective. And I must say, Joan, it is troubling uh, to me that after 20 plus years of research-based success that's been noted, we're only serving 8% of eligible children. It's almost as if the SALT vaccine has been invented and we're comfortable that it's only being administered to 8% to, uh, of, of the children in this country and 92% of them go without. So we invest in crutches and uh, uh, lung machines rather than making the investment where we know it works. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the reasons we're doing this webinar is to send the message that that's not acceptable um, 20 plus years after the program was started and with clear evidence. Um, Ron, it sounds like there's some investments like in Nebraska that are new investments in, from Oregon around early Head Start. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. The uh, legislature and the governor signed a bill called the Student Success Act that will invest billions of dollars into education in Oregon to give you an example of what that will mean. Currently, state funding for Early Head Start in Oregon results in approximately 65 children being served. With this new investment, it will go up to over a thousand children being served in Early Head Start. So it will make a significant differences, difference rather in the services, early Head Start services that are provided to Oregon families. Well, that's, that's another great example. So now we've already heard Nebraska and Oregon where they're investing in, early, in the early Head Start model. And again, for those listening that wanna advocate in their state, we can provide you follow-up information about both of those state models along with others. Um, you know, Ron, I'm curious, there's some funders listening to the webinar today or community people that work with foundations. What would you, what would your advice be to them about how they would talk about what they can learn from Early Head Start and how they would talk to local foundations about the importance of making sure there's investments in the, in the Early Head Start program? Well, frequently I, I find that many people connected with foundations do have uh, relationships with the business community or come from the business community. And I often r raise this question, how do you treat investments that you make for corporations? I would hope you do your research, you find out whether or not the entity works, whether or not it's been successful. And if you use that same approach for education, Early Head Start, it's been proven to make a tremendous impact, not only on the lives of children and families, but the entire country. So if you really want to make a significant impact that goes beyond mission statement, that goes beyond strategic initiatives, this is the best investment that you can make in the United States that will have a, not only a two-generational impact, but probably a three-generational impact upon children, communities, families. So I, I would suggest that follow the research, follow the research. The impacts from, head, from early Head Start are there for anyone to see. And if a foundation or if any philanthropic organization wants to have a, a significant impact upon children, families, communities, early Head Start is the best investment you can make. That's great advice. And I think that, again, for those people listening and taking this wisdom from both of our speakers so far, if there's ways that we can help you present the research or make the case in your communities, I think all of us would be happy to do that. Well, thanks, Ron. I think we'll come back to you. I want to turn to Jessica. Um, Jessica, thanks for um, being with us and <clears throat> for being our final speaker before we open this up to questions. You've been working with family childcare providers for many years. Can you describe, first of all, the All Our Kin model for those who may not know what you do with family childcare? 
Yeah, thank you so much. So um, first of all, this has been an amazing lineup of speakers. I've learned so much and I'm really excited to talk to you specifically about early Head Start in family child care and tell you a little bit about all our kids work with family child care overall. Before I get there, uh, just in case everyone isn't fully up to speed on family child care, I want to kind of ground us in a shared understanding of both family child care and of early Head Start Family Child Care Partnerships. So I used to say the child care system in this country was broken. And then I realized that was giving us too much credit because we don't have a child care system at all. And it doesn't work for so many families, particularly those with infants and toddlers. So across the country, women, primarily women, open their homes to care for each other's children. These are neighborhood-based educators who are often providing really wonderful early care and learning, but are often doing it in isolation and without a lot of support. These are family child care educators, and I believe they are truly the unsung heroes of our child care system. Uh, and in early Head Start family child care partnerships, what's incredibly exciting is that these family child care educators can participate fully as members of the early Head Start system. That is just like a center, they meet all the early Head Start performance standards, they deliver high quality care and education to families, and we are also able to scaffold what they do with comprehensive services. So I'll talk about that in just a minute, but first, just to linger on family child care one second longer, it's important to note that about 50% of all children spend at least some portion of their time in family child care. This is particularly true for infants and toddlers and for those families that have the greatest barriers to accessing care. So really putting family child care front and center in our thinking about children and families, I think is critical to the success of our children overall. So, uh, I'd like to go on to tell you a little bit about All Our Kin and what we do. So again, because we believe so deeply in the potential, the power, and the impact of family child care, we diver devote all our efforts to training, supporting, and sustaining family child care educators so that they have all the tools that they need to succeed as business owners, but also to support children and families and give them the best possible foundation for success in school and in life. Next slide, please. We do this through a quality highway, so through licensing support, we help home-based caregivers set up businesses that may meet health and safety standards and are part of a professional community. Through our very high-touch research-based coaching and training, we develop the highest quality educational programming and educational learning experiences in family child care programs. And finally, because family child care educators are also business people, we help them to have all the tools to run high-quality, sustainable businesses that can support them and their families over time. Next slide. Our outcomes are pretty well documented, which is really exciting. We build the supply of childcare, so even as family childcare programs are sadly closing across the country and across Connecticut, where all our kin began, we've seen those numbers increase significantly with support both for entering the field and remaining in the field once licensed. We've demonstrated that our family child care educators score over 50% higher on rigorous observational measures of quality. We've shown a return on investment of $15 to $20 for every dollar that we invest in our family child care educators because of their increased earnings and because of parents' increased ability to enter and remain in the workforce. And finally, we've shown significantly increased earnings for family child care educators themselves, which is deeply important to us because as I think everyone on this call knows, educators are underpaid and it's really important that we value their work, both so they can keep doing this work over time and because of what we owe them for the really important work that they do on behalf of children and families. Next slide. So All Our Kin right now works with about 5,000 family child care educators across cities in Connecticut and now New York City as well. Uh, 
Uh, I am so sorry. I cannot believe I said we are reaching 5,000 educators. We are reaching 5,000 children and about 875 family child care educators, uh, again, across Connecticut and New York. About two thirds of the children in these programs are subsidized through the child care and development block grant. Um, and we are beginning to train folks in other parts of the country as well, uh, including a really exciting partnership with Nebraska. So happy to have Nebraska on the call. Next slide, please. So in 2010, we took this sort of rich menu of services that we had and the really, really wonderful group of family child care educators that we worked with specifically in New Haven, Connecticut, which is where all our kids started. And we were fortunate enough to partner with the United Way of Greater New Haven and with ARA dollars, you saw that jump on the slide that Helen took us through, we were able to launch an early Head Start family child care partnership. So we work with, of our 875 family child care educators, we work with 12 through Early Head Start. It's a small part of what we do, but I think anyone on the team will tell you its impacts on families are so deep that it has become really a critical centerpiece of our work overall and kind of a learning lab for everything that we do with family child care educators. It builds on the work that we are already able to do around coaching and professional learning, our business business training, but we are able to do so much more with this group of parents and families and children because of what Early Head Start offers. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary team that works directly with children and families, and we're able to layer Early Head Start and Child Care and Development Block Grant dollars for maximum impact. And before we go on to the next slide, I just want to flag that you know, what Ronnie said resonated with me so much because uh, I'm going to talk about the benefits of the program, why we do it in a minute, but I want to pause to talk just about the relationships that this program has developed between staff and parents and between staff and family child care educators and parents because it is truly profound. I reached out to the early Head Start team right before this webinar to say, what are some of the things you want to be sure that I share about this model? And overwhelmingly, our staff responded, the deep respect that we are able to bring to parents, the deep connections and relationships that families family child care educators, members of the All Our Kin staff can develop with each other and how we are able to leverage that respect and those relationships on behalf of families in a truly collaborative way. Next slide. So by doing this, what are we able to accomplish? So the first thing is continuity of care. Remember, most of the children in our programs are funded through the Child Care and Development Block Grant. For those of you who don't know, this is a funding source for which families must apply every year. There are restrictions not only around income, but around work status, and the program can sometimes be in jeopardy depending on funding levels. Early Head Start makes it possible for a group of families to know that they have care they can count on from zero to three, now zero to four in the child care partnerships, and we're able to build connections so that they can transition seamlessly into preschool programs. So it's continuity of care for families at a critical time in the lives of both children and parents, and it's also continuity and stability for family child care educators themselves who are running small businesses and know that they can count on funding to keep their programs going over time. Accessible community-based programs. I can't say enough about this. Family child cares are located in the neighborhoods where parents live and work. And we are able to offer a parent who comes to us a choice of programs all over the city. Someone who may live down the street from a family. Someone with whom they feel comfortable, whose schedule fits, fits their work needs. It just makes Early Head Start accessible to so many families who might otherwise have challenges participating. Holistic, oh, quality. Quality early learning experiences. So I talked about this study, right, that showed that all our kin's family child care educators scored on average over 50% higher than non-all our kin family child care educators. 
Tony Porter, our fabulous evaluator, insisted that we disqualify our early Head Start participants from the study. Why? Because with the kind of rocket fuel that early Head Start training dollars offer, our early Head Start educators get so good so fast, she thought it would unfairly skew our numbers and make us look better than we are. Um, holistic supports for children and families. So the whole family impact. Our team has shared so many beautiful stories about families who were able to find permanent housing, where parents were able to find jobs, where the whole family found themselves in a radically different situation as a result of their partnership with Early Head Start. And as we all know so well, a family's well-being correlates very deeply with the well-being of their children. And what's great is that, of course, even as a parent transitions into a new job, childcare exists to support and make that transition possible. Health and wellness. I could talk for three hours about this. I promise I will not. But what we have learned about the impact of being able to make sure that children have, for example, dental screenings, that their teeth are healthy, that they're not in pain, that children are getting glasses if they need them, that they're up to date on immunizations and well care, enlisting family child care educators as full partners in the health team. Uh, it's been profound in terms of the impacts of children who may have had undiagnosed challenges that were never found until we had a multidisciplinary team to offer support. Engagement of multiple stakeholders. Family child care educators are often, as I mentioned, isolated. They're left out of systems. Early Head Start provides a very direct bridge to many of those systems. I will just mention one of them, which is working with agencies that are funded through Part C of IDA and serve children with developmental delays. We have able to provide not only screening, but really authentic partnerships with the workers at those agencies so that again, they become an extension of our multidisciplinary team and we ensure that family childcare educators are part of that team and that their input is fully valued and they know everything that's happening with that child so they can scaffold and support those strategies during the family child care day. And finally, spillover effects. So often family child care educators are not only serving children in early Head Start, they have other kids in their programs as well. All those children are benefiting from the multidisciplinary team, from the increased training, from the increased funding in a really wonderful way that extends out the impact of our early Head Start work. So I will pause there. Uh, and as I said, much more uh, I could share, but I will stop there for now. Jessica, uh, thank you so much. And I can see your passion, feel your passion for the transformation that happens when early Head Start dollars are used in support of family child care providers. What do you, one question before I open it up, what are the key components of early Head Start? that should be incorporated into family child care networks? I mean, what's the part of this that goes into the network that supports the programs? Because yeah, uh, yeah. This, what you say about that can be funded by other program dollars. Yeah, I, I think that that's such a critically important question because as you've pointed out, Early Head Start is available only to a limited group of families, but I actually have some scenes, some really wonderful initiatives to incorporate some of the best of what Early Head Start has to offer. Um, and I think there's a lot more that we could do with state dollars, with philanthropic funding, et cetera. So the first thing I would say, invest in staffed family child care networks. So so, you know, there's really, really terrific research um, about the impact of staffed family child care networks and what it takes for a staff family child care network to be successful. Having staff who are specially trained in both early care and education and working with family child care, offering coaching that's truly strength-based and relational and recognizes the unique opportunities and backgrounds of family child care educators. It's also essential to build peer connections for family child care educators because it's really hard to be one adult working with kids all day. So setting up spaces for peer mentorship, 
peer connection and support. Those are two things that are vitally important that can be built into staffed family child care networks with or without the early Head Start dollars. Second, offer robust professional learning opportunities for family child care educators. Now again, in Early Head Start, there are dedicated technical assistance funds available that we've been able to use to do all kinds of things that we can't do across our network. Nonetheless, we've been able to offer many wonderful trainings, multi-part series, um, and really high level content to our family child care educators, even without the, again, rocket fuel funding that Early Head Start provides. And I think being able to do that is about funding, but it's also about respect, about recognizing that it's worth investing in truly high quality professional learning, best in class, if we want what family child care educators offer to come up to that standards, and also offering professional learning that meets family child care educators' needs, meaning it's offered on evenings and weekends, it's in multiple languages, it's in places people can get to, it has food for people who've been working all day, all those pieces of the work. Okay. Well, the, uh, the next thing, uh, I'll, I'll go quickly, sorry. <laughs> um, investing in stable child care funding streams, right? So the Child Care Development Block Grant uh, is pretty much what family child care is built on in most places. It's not always reliable. Some states contract with family child care networks. I think that's a really exciting mechanism to use to build sustainable programs. I think it is quite possible and would be really exciting to see investments in family advocates and above all health consultants to work with family child care networks. Um, and this could be done at the state level. I know some folks are doing this as part of Promise Neighborhoods or Promise Zones. And finally, engage diverse stakeholders. Sit down at the table with the folks who are doing health, workforce development, all these different streams. Even if your program cannot itself provide the resources of a multidisciplinary team, enlist the partners that exist all around you. Uh, let them know what family child care is and why it matters and recruit them as partners in this work. Um, and I will just share with you, because I do know time is limited, my last slide, because this has my contact information. It also has our Facebook Early Head Start page. Um, but I would encourage you, you know, check out our website, follow us on social media, and, and reach out to me directly if you have questions about anything I've shared. Thank you so much, Jessica, and for your enthusiasm for Early Head Start being integrated into the child care system. Uh, we're getting questions coming in. Um, I want to turn to Ron to come back to this parent question first, because it was the first thing you said was what made a difference is the staff and the relationship of the staff to the parent. Talk a little bit, give people a vision of what a family support worker does with families, because I've always thought that was a big piece of what's missing in the child care system, was those family advocates and that attitude towards families. Well, Joan, I think it has, has to come from every staff person that comes in contact with parents. That begins when the parent walks into the office. Who is the person that greets the, the, the parent at the front door? How do they treat the, the parent at the front door? And when you have staff that are from the community and who respect parents, it makes it a lot easier to develop those ongoing relationships. So it can't just be the advocate. It can't just be the teacher. It has to be the person who's providing mental health services. It has to be the people who are providing health services. And it has to be the person that comes in contact, most importantly, with that parent every day. And again, I strongly feel if you have staff who are from the community and who want to develop and maintain and strengthen those bonds of respect, those bonds of affection, it makes the job a lot easier. And unfortunately, I don't think enough attention is given to the job that staff perform on a daily basis, and certainly it's not re rewarded financially. So I think we have a long way to go. And again, what do we do about the 92% who will never see early Head Start services? It's almost as if that our attention is on, yes, we've done a good job with the 8%, but the 92%, what do we say to them? 
wait on a waiting list until perhaps you get in. So that, that's my biggest concern is that let's not overlook the majority of families who will never see early Head Start, who will never be touched by a home visitor, who will never be touched by a family advocate, and who certainly will not be in anybody's center-based program. Yeah, that is the, that is the core message. Uh, two things, Ron, thank you for pointing out that as important as the family advocate is because of their central role, it's the whole staff that has, uh, that has to have an attitude of support and understanding and appreciation for parents. I think that's critical. Um, I want to just say, because we got some questions coming in about uh, the data and what does the 8% represent, that, that's the figure that um, many of us have been using, using 2018 data. But as a former federal person myself, you know, the data is always lag behind. I think even if it's 9%, it's still too low. That's the, that's the bottom line. And it shouldn't be that 20 plus years after the program started with the research that we have, that you get 90 or 85 or 90% of children not being served. That's the overall message. But yes, the data is often a little behind. Um, I, I, one of the questions coming in, um, Helen, I'm going to turn to you about if you were talking to people that didn't have access to Early Head Start, but wanted to base their new way of programming for infants and toddlers on the Early Head Start research, what would you recommend they do? I, I would imagine uh, that's a great question and I would imagine there are quite a few different ways that one could approach this. Um, okay, let's just a moment here. I think I might be on mute. Um, okay, I believe um, it's important to think about the systems that we do have. I love what Jessica was saying about, about systems. In Nebraska, we have taken a schools at the center approach and working with communities, community by community by community, you know, communities for kids is what we call them, in fact. And it, within each community, like what are the resources that we have for building a system so that we can provide as many services with as high quality as possible within the context of what we have. Our, our early Head Start um, child care partnerships um, have been pretty successful in working with schools who become kind of the source or the center of it has really contributed to um, turning that into a system and now is serving so many, many more children than we were able to serve through direct services. So um, that's, that's one approach. Helen, while I have you, we had a question come in about the, about the combination model. Can you talk a little bit about the, the results that you had and what a combination model was from the research perspective? Right. Um, there were a group of programs that in various ways in early Head Start, and again, now we're back in the mid 90s, who were doing both some form of center-based and home-based care together. And so um, we grouped them as combination because they weren't strictly home visiting and they weren't strictly center-based. And at that time, um, we found that when the, by the time the children were three, these children were looking really good because we had the very positive effects that we were seeing from the center-based programs um, in them. And we also were seeing the positive effects on the parents that we were then seeing in the home-based programs as well. So in other words, they were kind of getting the good things from both. Um, why didn't these, these programs continue to bear out um, at age five and then at grade five? I mean, some of those had to do perhaps with community factors, but I think it's also a point that maybe you don't have to offer every service to every child, you know, like comprehensive 
um, full day, full year childcare and home visiting at the same time, but rather stay with the principle of Head Start, which is comprehensive services, but they can be provided in a number of different ways. So I just would say that program model perhaps hasn't taken off. I would also say it's going to be quite expensive. And so it works better for communities to be able to go in one direction or the other, potentially center-based or home-based. Um, and I, that's all I can say about it. I'm, you know, I'm not sure um, what we would say about that today. Well, I think um, one thing I would just want to clarify when, because these terms mean different things to different people, the, the home based is we're not talking, we're talking about home visiting when we say home based in, in um, absolutely in Head Start context. In the child care context, when we say home based, it's family child care or kids and kin care. And so sometimes we talk uh, across each other when, when we're meeting different things. So what you're saying is most of the programs chose either. Home, a home visiting model, or a um, or a center-based model. I would say, and and Ron can talk a little bit about this. Home visiting has always been a part of Head Start, right from the very beginning. Um, you know, Ron, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but it wasn't either or. It was always um, you can't get to know the families if you don't do some home visiting. Ron, do you want to comment on that? Oh yeah, it's, it's it's always been a part of Head Start almost since its inception that, that teachers uh, make at least two or if, if necessary more home visits a year. It's still uh, part of what all Head Start programs are responsible for. And again, it's not just an academic exercise. It's to get to know the children, get to know the parents, and to for parents to feel comfortable with our staff, with the people who are working with their children on a daily basis. So it's part of, of an ongoing effort to, again, establish that bond of respect, to establish that bond that says that we want, just as you, the best possible experience for your child. And this is only one step that we're taking. And with our, our home-based program, our home visitors do that on a weekly basis, going into the home, helping parents to figure out, here's what you can do to work with your child. It's not going to cost a a boatload of money, and here's how you sustain that. And oh, by the way, have you made that appointment to update the immunization? How are things going with the, the effort to find uh, permanent housing? Those are the kinds of relationships, and, and what I see that parents trust our staff so much that they share the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's up to us as a program to be helpful. Can we help when you run up against it and you need to find a way to pay that light bill? Can we help when you need a way to, to uh, take care of the rent that's kind of short this week? Parents are not going to make that request to anyone unless they trust staff implicitly. And that's, the again, for me, the unsung heroes of Head Start, early Head Start, are Head Start staff people who receive very little attention in these discussions but they are the ones that have made this program work from day one. And Joan and I, I guess you, we are lucky that we were there from day one when this legislation was di discussed, debated, and in the White House when Clinton signed it. So I don't know what that means other than we're old, but having watched this program develop over the years, I think the, fo the ingredient that is missed is the role that he early Head Start and Head Start staff play on a daily basis. Yeah, without without a doubt, Ron and I, you know, I, I think that I think that's why to the people that are listening, we there, there's a little impatience when we hear that we're only reaching such a small number of children, given what we've learned over the years. So thank you for that very moving um, commentary on what what it means to trust to build trust. Um, Helen, we did get another question in about what is meant by the PPV T3 on some of your slides. So some of the listeners are not as familiar with that. Could you tell them what, what is that outcome? Um, the PPV T3, excuse me, 
get an echo, um, refers to the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, which is a test of receptive language. And um, it's frequently used in research studies, um, seems to be highly predictive of children's vocabulary later and of school success. And I think somebody even posted, um, thank you very much for the person who did that, posted the reference for the PPVT3. Um, to have a score of 100, um, the scores are what's known as um, standardized. A score of 100 represents a national average um, for the receptive language test, the PPVT or Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. And so the closer scores come to that national average, um, some people interpret that as um, closing the achievement gap, which is um, what how we interpreted the progress that we were seeing for children who had cumulative experiences. Another reason we use the PPVT um, in our studies is that it measures children's receptive language at age three, but it also measures it at age 10. And so we're able to track um, how children grow and change in terms of their receptive language. And of course, that's related to reading. So for all those that are doing grade level reading campaigns, using those kind of markers as children are growing in the very earliest years is, is critical. But it's not the marker, it's what we do. It's what we do to the children to help them progress in the families. Difference. Um, Sarah, I don't know if there are other questions coming in, if you want to open up the mic to anyone to ask a question. gotten a quick follow-up question on that PPVT discussion that Helen was just um, sharing. Wondering if the PPVT is adapted for children who are English as a second language versus those for whom English is their home language. Is there any kind of differentiation um, to understand the vocabulary development and um, learning for children who are also learning a second language as they're growing? Helen? Helen, did you hear that question? So it, it looks as though um, uh, Helen is dealing with some um, technology issues. She's not getting sound from us. So I'll share a question that has recently been posted from Sherry Ruddock. She was wondering uh, whether or not the home visiting programs other than Early Head Start and Head Start home-based programs were included in um, the studies, such as the MICHA funded home visiting programs. And let me see if... Remember, this, the, when the original studies were done is before the maternal, infant, and early childhood program was launched, that came right really almost decades later, the exciting thing about the maternal and infant early childhood program was right from the beginning, if everyone remembers, the agency had to do an evidence-based review um, to make sure that people were using evidence-based uh, curriculum and programming. And early Head Start was included in that very original list. So there was rec recognition right from the earliest days of McVeigh, that early Head Start was an evidence-based model that people could use their McVeigh funding for. So as McVeigh expands, early Head Start is expanding in the upcoming year, but there are ways that you can use McVeigh funding to do an early Head Start model. Uh, I don't know if you're back on, Helen, and if you heard the question about English language learners and Spanish speaking MPDDD. I, I did not hear that question. Well, somebody was asking a follow up question about the PPVT and wondering if um, there if it was adapted for children who are learning English as a second language. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, we used a um, a Spanish version of the PPVT referred to as the TVIP. 
And so um, the PBBT itself measure is administered in English, but the TV, TVIP was administered in Spanish. Thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to announce that I've, I've just launched the, um, that quick uh, survey poll that I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. Um, so while we're continuing with Q&A, and I would encourage additional questions coming in, uh, if folks are, have additional questions for our presenters, just take a moment to please share um, a little bit of feedback um, using that poll, um, and it will help to inform future conversations. Um, are there other questions coming in um, while we're looking, or can we do we open the? Is it only through the chat box, or people uh, ask a question through their audio? Uh, it is only through the chat box. So, the, although if somebody had a comment that they wanted to share, you can feel free to raise your hand. There's an option for that um, on there as well, and we could unmute you. Um, one question, um, an additional question. The last webinar that we had in December was with Parent Teacher Home Visits, which is um, doing a lot of what Ronnie was just talking about in terms of kind of the 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 school staff and the educators going into homes and building those relationships with families of older children, so school age um, from K through 12, and wondering if that approach is an outgrowth of um, kind of what we've seen in terms of the impacts of those home visits that have been such a critical component of Head Start and early Head Start over the years. And I don't know if um, if any of you all can speak to that, but that, that was a question that came in from someone. Um, it, it's hard to know from that question if, if the question is about the parent-child home model, um, and was that the model that was presented, which of course is, a, is an important home visiting program. I think the bottom line here is you've got to do continuity of services. So it's not, you know, home visiting, at zero to, to two years old, and then you don't do anything. If, unfortunately, what we see in early Head Start is sometimes children can't then access preschool, so you don't get that continuity. Although what Helen shared with us tells us that you're more likely to get formal programming in the preschool years if you've had an early Head Start experience. But you know, I think the bottom line here is you've got a continuity of services including good schools. So we do all this in the early years, and then you go into poor schools that don't have the resources and support or orientation towards families, I don't think you're gonna get continuity of results. I don't know if any of our other speakers mm -hmm. have comment on that. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to add to what Joan was sharing? about that? Um, this is Helen, and I totally agree with what Joan said. And um, I think a bottom line for me is that Early Head Start has the components for a comprehensive program, whether you take a dominant center-based approach or home visiting approach, as Ronnie said, you're still going to be focused on parents no matter what and you need to be if you're center-based you need a parenting component and if you're home-based you need of course a child component and so it's just a really wonderful model and our experience in nebraska has been that coupling that within the school systems and then working with existing providers in some cases or starting new programs in others has been a really wonderful model i think i would add to that back in the 15 years ago when we were proposing this, I remember somebody saying, well, these principals and superintendents are going to want to have babies in their systems. But the truth is we are not able to fund as many school districts as want to have the zero to three services of sixpence. Um, I mean, we're capped in, uh, we're working off an endowment and so it, unless the stock market <laughs> takes off, we can't fund any more programs or, or else we need to get more funding from the state. But 
these programs are extremely popular with the schools and uh, they've embraced providing services for infants and toddlers uh, that couple beautifully with our pre-k and our head start programs in the same communities so before we close i i want to if no other questions came in sarah i want to thank our three wonderful speakers and you know just it's heartening to know that we've got the evidence we've got um and we can make it accessible to people we've got the models both at the federal level and at the state level and some of them emerging in the communities um what brought me to this i'll share in 1972 when i was teaching three-year-olds and they were coming into the early, the head start program already behind health needs that had gone unrecognized. I always wondered why we were starting so late. And I think that has saved me for decades. And, you know, I think it's time to change that picture. Uh, a wonderful friend and colleague, Portia Kennel from now from Nebraska had worked in early Head Start, has worked in early Head Start throughout the life of the program. Ha and I were talking the other day and she said, you know, this program really has built the capacity to deliver good services. For and, um, and I think that has to continue to grow. So I, again, I want to thank everyone for their participation. We're all ready to help the people on the line. If you want to advocate for the Early Head Start program, uh, federal funds, uh, state funds, community funds, we're ready to help. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I would just like to reiterate what Joan just shared in terms of thanking um, our presenters, Helen Rakes, Ronnie Herndon, and Jessica Sager. And I would like to add my appreciation also to Joan, who played the dual role of both serving as the moderator for today's conversation, as well as a content expert sharing her background, going back to her first awareness about the importance of starting before early, uh, you know, before Head Start age back in 1972. I would also like to thank all of you who joined in the conversation with us today. I hope you learned as much as I did about um, some of the importance of, uh, important components of Early Head Start and the need to uh, support this program. Um, I um, would like to remind everyone about some of the upcoming webinars. You can see them again on the screen right now. Um, next week's will actually kind of continue this focus on the early years as we learn about the basics principles, um, which are designed to help community partners engage and support parents in um, support parents of infants and toddlers in promoting their children's um, early learning and development. Um, in addition uh, to the schedule of Lear Learning Tuesday's webinars that we have upcoming, I'd also like to share with you another online learning opportunity for next week. It's going to be on Wednesday, January 15th, and it's a show and tell of emerging innovations um, designed to support parents in the early years. It's organized by Promise Ventures Studios, and it will include, as you can see on the screen, a video presentation by the campaign's director, Ralph Smith. So I hope you'll be able to join in that conversation as well. Um, again, I just want to thank our presenters, and I want to thank all of you for joining in the conversation, and um, hope to see you back for our future DLR Learning Tuesdays webinar. Until then, have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.